Good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing uh, very well. This is our third day of the uh, Explore Shape Deal virtual matchmaking event, and the theme for today is ICT. We're going to explore how ICT uh, can bring sustainability and resilience to urban areas. And we're going to kick off the day uh, with uh, with an introduction by uh, two colleagues from uh, from the European Commission, Svetoslav Mikhailov from DG Connect and uh, Georg Huben of uh, DG Energy. Now, just, just to give you a, a few basic facts before we really get going, uh, we're pleased to see that we are having 207 participants registered to this event. And to date, we have uh, managed to create 61 face-to-face, -face, oh, not face-to-face, one-to-one meetings, uh, or really face-to-face -face because there is video involved, 61 face-to-face uh, -face video meetings between participants. And we also have 25 organizations uh, who are interested to meet uh, with our investor network to uh, submit their project concepts uh, for review and to look for investments for their ideas. So that's really encouraging. I would like to uh, point to the opportunity to still have one-to-one -one meetings, just register for the networking sessions for today and the automatic scheduler will link you up to uh, relevant people. Now, uh, I want to hand over to uh, Georg and Svetoslav to get us going for, for the day uh, today. Thank you. Do note, by the way, that there is an opportunity to ask questions uh, to the panelists and uh, to the, uh, the various presenters. We do that via Slido. Uh, there's a link on the page that you're looking at uh, right now. Um, just uh, go to that link and post your question. We will see those questions in, uh, in, in our own screens and we will try to answer those with uh, the expertise of the, of the panelists. Furthermore, there's always somebody around from our team to help you with any question you might have in the meeting area and help desk. It's a, a Microsoft Teams environment and there's a schedule of, uh, of team members who are also available to you until the very end of the day. Thank you. Now over to Georg and Svetoslav. Um, thank you, Ilko. I guess I'm waiting for my colleague before I start. Here we go. <laughs> yes. Good morning. So, um, good morning. Uh, another day. Uh, of the matchmaking event. We had three days, two days so far. This is day number three. We will now look into the world of ICT and hope to have many interesting insights. But before we go ahead into the day, let me give you a quick, together with my colleague um, Svetoslav Mihailov from DG Connect, where I cordially welcome here, um, a, a short introduction, a scene setter, uh, for what we are talking about, in fact. So, first question um, is actually, uh, and that's a pertinent question, in fact, uh, why are we uh, concerned about cities? And why exactly are we now concerned about cities in, at this specific period? Well, let's say the main arguments uh, really didn't change uh, also over the past 20, 30 years. Um, and these arguments even get more important, um, such like 75% uh, uh, of the EU population live in cities, and a, a good share of that is represented by small and medium-sized cities. Cities are responsible for 85% of the EU's GDP. Um, cities deliver on all possible kinds of things, on jobs, on growth, uh, on resilience investments, and so on. And last but not least, cities are at the forefront of COVID-19. So you can turn it how you want. Cities are really um, in the driving seat of, of innovation. Of They are the front line of many, many processes. And therefore, uh, we still think it's, it's very worthwhile thinking about cities and tackling uh, their needs and helping them uh, to, to cope with uh, COVID-19. Now, um, there is, of course, on EU level, there is a framework uh, to support cities. 
Um, I've just picked a few here on, these, on, on this screen. There is, first of all, the European Green Deal, of which you might have heard of already. The European Green Deal uh, tackles inter, uh, inter alia two, two things which I picked, uh, um, but which are also, of course, related to ICT. Um, there is the massive uh, renovation wave uh, and also cleaner transport and logistics, both of which very clearly link uh, to ICT, which is also the topic of today. Uh, then there was uh, quite recently uh, a proposal of 750 billion euro targeted at COVID-19 recovery um, uh, called the Next Generation EU. Uh, the interesting thing about that is actually that it confirms the European Green Deal also as the EU strategy for recovery. So there is again a strong link between EU policy taking COVID-19 into account as an important aspect. Last but not least, we have the next framework uh, program uh, around the corner, if you want, and that's Horizon Europe. There is a mission on climate neutral and smart cities, for example, but there will also be a strong continued support to initiatives such, such like this one, um, the Smart Cities Marketplace, but also to all kinds of other, other uh, smart city projects, also including uh, urban platforms, for example. Um, and with this, I would like to hand over to um, uh, my colleague Svetoslav, who give us now a bit more detailed info and insight on what the EU does for the digital transformation in cities. Svetoslav, please. Yeah. Thanks, Georg. Good morning, everybody, again. Uh, First, I wanted to supplement. Georg already started by presenting the previous slide, the, the initiatives there. He, he spoke that there is the digital component covered. And I just have to remind you that even within the text of European Green Deal and then Next Generation EU is referring to this also in this third pure, they're talking about accelerating the twin and green digital transitions, transformations in both texts it is mentioned. And then Within the European Green Deal, it's clearly mentioned in many places in the text that ICT will be one of the main tools to achieve the sustainability, as Georg also mentioned within mobility, energy and the other areas. And also ICT itself has to be addressed its sustainability and its environmental impact. Uh, having said that, I'm coming back to my slide now. Uh, in the past, the work of the EIP and, uh, and other initiatives that we have had. We have developed ICT solutions for integrated services uh, in the cities, for integrating sectors and so on. This has to be taken for the next framework period. And there we have developed a number of programs to address this and to support it financially and otherwise. So on one side, we have financial instruments such as the Digital Europe program, which is an, uh, another program in parallel to Horizon Europe that is meant to support the deployment of digital infrastructure and digital services. Within it, we have specific parts, specific projects on, on urban, on data. And these are projects on deploying urban data platforms of scale, on AI-based urban data services that will be deployed on top of these platforms. There will be cross sector, they will be portable, they will be based on artificial intelligence, they will be dealing with sustainability, energy mobility and other areas. We want to deploy digital twins within the program, again using the platforms that will be deployed in the field. Uh, there will be a European data space, urban data space, which will be kind of federating the data coming from the urban platforms and other sources, and which will be used again for services on the European level. It can be used also with some other components that we're preparing, such as the testing and experimentation facilities for cities, digital innovation hubs for city solutions, and so on and so on. They're all part of this program. Uh, and then in order to, to kind of help the community and, and instigated by this community, the city community, we have also started and participating together with the community, together with stakeholders that actually initiated this, the Living in You initiative, which is meant to bring economic and social benefits of the digital transformation to all communities. We dare to use power with digital services, technology, infrastructures and skills. 
the technology service that I described is exactly the same that I did to your program. But in order for the community to, to manage, they need to work together. They need to overcome many other obstacles. Technologically deploying, this is one part of it. But there is also developing the skills. There is also financing the solutions from other sources because digital program is providing co-funding. But of course, we need other sources uh, in some cases. Uh, and they'll be dealing with uh, legal constraints and so on and so different strengths. And this will be explained by some people that have actually initiated this in our panel just after our presentation, welcoming presentation. Uh, then another place where we finance the cities and concretely the connectivity within the cities, this is the Connected Europe facilities. Two, where there is a part which is dedicated to the local 5G wireless connectivity for communities. Like this, we are making sure that we can collect the data from Internet of Things devices and funnel it to the platforms that will be deployed and the services within the Digital Europe program. So this is kind of complementary to what we do in the Digital Europe program. And then we also connected to these data spaces. We are also deploying European operational digital platforms for energy and mobility. Again, linked to energy and mobility, it is ICT based and will be providing data for innovative services or increasing the, the amount of renewable energy and also supplying data to these data spaces for other even cross sector more innovative solutions. Uh, there are other instruments developed by other services of the Commission, such as the Intelligent Cities Challenge which is uh, dealing with advanced technologies for smart, sustainable growth. Uh, it will help, the, the, it is continuation of the Digital Cities Challenge, which was for 41 cities and now we're going for 100 cities. Uh, and it will uh, also help to tackle the pandemic crisis. And this is also kind of taking it from where Georg left there. All the initiatives are leading in, in, in this direction because we are suffering now quite a fall back from the crisis. Uh, they'll help they construct their economies with steering them in the direction of green and sustainable growth. Uh, they will improve the quality of life and create new opportunities for the business communities. And then, uh, and then there are some other opportunities to supplement the funding that we have in a digital Europe program, connected Europe facilities, intelligent cities challenge and so on. And these are the regional funds where there is a part on urban development, which has is dedicating around 6% to city programs. And we have to see that, that the, the community has been quite engaged, this kind of regional community cities, etc., within the digital transformation partnership of the urban agenda for the EU. So there are programs developed there which can be taken further now into the new program of the ERDF for deployment, for, for action. So these are some of the things that I wanted to mention here. Of course, there's a lot more. And I think some of the things that I, uh, I didn't mention uh, will be mentioned during the panel discussion, I think, by our, by our speakers. As Georg said also in Horizon Europe, there are specific topics dedicated apart from the mission, which itself has identified digital as the main tool to address the sustainability of cities and climate neutrality. There are also specific calls on digital, on urban platforms, taking them further for the next stage, the next generation, and so on. So it's really kind of a comprehensive program that we have foreseen in order to support the transition, the digital transition of the cities. Okay, <clears throat> thanks a lot so far. <laughs> um, I guess uh, we also have to set a bit the, um, the context of today and um, that's uh, represented with the next slide. Um, as Svet said, we will dive deeper into EU policy and how that works uh, in the frame and linking with the marketplace and so on. But since this is a matchmaking event, I just wanted to explain you what matchmaking is that actually about and why we do this event. Well, it's three very simple steps, explore, shape, deal. So we see and learn what's next. Um, 
we uh, give an opportunity uh, to project promoters to shape their project in order to really make it bankable, in order to put it in front of investors or banks um, for finally having a deal uh, for financing. And that's pretty much the overall context and aim of this event. Um, so um, that um, I just just to re-emphasize that one once again. Um, um, so so with, with that, actually, um, we are at the end of this little welcome um, uh, uh, session. And uh, to all participants, we would like to wish, of course, much success, uh, lots of insights. And uh, with no further ado, um, I would like uh, with this to hand over to my colleague uh, Svetoslav, who will moderate uh, the panel, which starts um, in, in a minute. Thank you. Yes, as um, we are just in time for starting the panel, which is great. And as we have quite a number of participants, we will be going quickly into it. I will myself present the participants. So starting with myself, my name is Svet Mikhailov. I'm from the European Commission, DG Connect, Unit H5, which is on smart mobility and living. And I'll be working on smart cities and digitalization of the cities for the duration of Horizon 2020. Uh, I will present now shortly the rest of the panels, only the relevant part of the bio, bio, bios of the participants, as we don't have that much time. So we have Wim de Kinderen from the city of Eindhoven, who is also represented today EuroCities and the European Network of Innovation Labs. Uh, of Living Labs, sorry. And uh, he is also representing the Living in EU initiative, uh, where he is the leader of the education and capacity building strand. And also, he is leading the cross strand work among all the strands that are. Our second participant is Martin Briskov, who is a research director and associate professor at Aarhus University. In, he is the chairman of the Open and Agile Smart Cities. He is also in the Center for Digital Transformation of Cities and Communities in Denmark, and he is the leader of the technical group under the Living in EU initiative. Third, we have Graham Koklo, who is uh, from Urban DNA, who has been very much the stakeholder leader of the IPSCC throughout the years. And apart from this, and why he is on the panel in the ICT day is because he was the lead and driver of the Integrated Infrastructure Asia Cluster, which created a number of the solutions that we are not taking further into the next period. And this will be explained by the participants in the panel. Then we have Georg, who already spoke, uh, and from DigiNR, who also has been on the commission side, the motivator, the, the flag bearer of the APACC, so to say. He was the motor behind it, who made it happen. And Last but not least is Victoire Champenois from DigiMove, which is representing the, the unit in DigiMove, which is the third partner into the managing, the co-running of the EIP SEC through all these years. Uh, and I have had the pleasure to work with side by side with all these distinguished members of the panel in all these initiatives and partnership and clusters that I mentioned so far. So maybe not to go into a cliche of further ado, but let's get started with the questions. So maybe, Wim, you can tell us more about the Living in EU initiative and its vision. Wim, you're muted. Yes, thank you, Martin, to point me to that. I was just saying that uh, Living in the EU is, um, is an initiative building on uh, a political declaration on joining forces to boost the digital transformation in our cities, signed today by 70 cities. And it's all motivated by the big need for impact and the knowledge that uh, we already have so many good solutions existing today, which all too often have actually limited impact and limited applications. And the fact that we can only make a meaningful difference if we collaborate more on different levels. So it's 
also no real coincidence that living in the EU actually has its origins in the Urban Agenda Partnership on Digital Transformation, which is a multi-level collaboration between cities, some European member states and the European Commission. And as a city of Eindhoven, which I'm representing and working for, we actually put this idea on the table with your cities and decided immediately to have other networks such as uh, Open and Agile Smart Cities, the European Network of Living Labs to join this movement, as of course they were working on the same wave of ideas. And it's nothing new, but uh, many concerns, many observations uh, come together in living in EU. The baseline of upscaling digital solutions in its core refers to the goal to allow, for example, cities to not always start from scratch and reinvent the wheel, but rather we want to guide them towards existing solutions on which then they can build further, perhaps in collaboration with other cities who face similar challenge, um, but always with a specific solution for them in mind. So it's more customized upscaling, I would say, rather than pure replication. And for the real uptake and upscale, a few other basic and more structural conditions need to be in place or need to be modified. On a legal scale, for example, financial aspects and the funding of everything, which is what we are discussing today as well, and the technical conditions, such as a key role for platforms on which Martin Vinskov will elaborate in a few minutes. All of this together should contribute to the technological leadership in and of the European Union, the European way of digitalization, if you want, which topics such as data ownership, privacy, trust on top of our minds. Items which in these post-corona recovery times have even gained importance, you will all acknowledge. So designing parties, which is cities, but also regions and member states can join and are already joining. They commit to six basic principles, such as citizen centricity, and they adhere to five commitments, the financial one, the technical one, the legal, the education and the capacity building, and monitoring and measuring results. And all of these five commitments, of course, are interconnected. It's only when five of them are fully um, up and running that we will get to the results that we want. Living in the U dot living dash in dot EU is a website which I would really uh, invite you to visit. Um, you can find a declaration there. I would invite everybody to sign it together with the 70 people, 70 cities we already have on board. And you will then be able to participate in each of the five strands according to your own wishes. And one of the tools that we will also be providing you in the next months is a, is a processing tool which will guide you to digital transformation steps to take within your own community. So that's basically the basis of living in the user. Thank you, Wim. Martin, can you tell us what do we concretely converge on in the living in EU? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Seth and Georg and everyone for the invitation to be here. And thanks, Wim, for the overview of uh, the living in .eu initiative. Um, well, there are so many technologies and so many things we can do. There's so much data out there that can be leveraged. And certainly with the COVID-19 situation, we have seen that just having data out there, having actors and agencies who are ready to do things isn't enough. If it's so fragmented that we don't have easy ways to link uh, things together. So what the Living in the EU initiative has very simply done is to see, okay, so what are the obvious things to converge on, such as uh, semantics of data, so we don't describe one the same type of data in one way in one sector and in a different way in another sector. On the other hand, we don't want to enforce a very, very rigid a regime of uh, specifications completely top down. I think the uh, European Union has been marred by harmonization fatigue, where you know everything from cucumbers to um, other products really need to be harmonized. It seems for the sake of harmonization. So what we have done is quite different. We have said, what is the minimal we need 
in order to reap the benefits of being interoperable? How little can we actually have in common and still exchange? So in the subgroup, which is one of five, um, looking at the technology aspect, we very simply um, have created a uh, baseline of uh, existing prominent uh, European initiatives. Um, we have furthermore identified, okay, so um, where are the gaps? Are there things we still need to uh, define? And in fact, um, it seems like we have pretty much everything we need in order to across the board to deliver digitally enhanced services for citizens. We call this specification MIMS plus for the minimal interoperability that is in there. But just putting out the specs, the specifications, it doesn't really can stand alone. Because would you put those specifications just in front of a procurement specialist, a lawyer, or a policymaker and say, oh yes, we need to adopt these somewhat arcane uh, technical specifications? No, it would not work. So what we're also doing is two more things. We're creating together with the colleagues in the other strands, so from financing, from the legal perspective, from the skills, from the KPIs and monitoring perspective, you're creating an operational guide, which actually says very simply, okay, so how do you put these specifications into practice? Where are the companies that can supply this? Um, and that leads to the third point, that we really support this kind of, um, not just general matchmaking, um, but actually where can you then find these services? If you're a developer, if you're a company who want to cater for the European cities, where are you know, the components that are already um, certified to deliver this kind of interoperability? And that is catalogs to support uh, marketplaces. So three things come out of the technology subgroup. Specifications, uh, an operational guide, and um, concrete catalogs to support the market uptake. And again, we don't build it from scratch we put together all the good things, all the good guides and learnings that have come out of uh, not just European uh, research and innovation, um, but also really the knowledge that has been produced on the local and on the member state national level. And what we're seeing now is that this initiative really can glue together much of the power that is mobilized locally. So if you sit in a city and you have a local initiative where you're looking at whatever, open data or energy optimization in buildings. You don't have to start from scratch. You can connect to the living in.eu initiative and it will give you leverage to focus on those particular needs and concerns you have in your local community. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Now that we have heard quite some things about the living in you, maybe we switch to the APSCC and Graham, what are the tools and guidance that the APACC has provided for building capacities in the cities? Thanks, Svet. Um, Wim mentioned one favorite word, scratch. Um, uh, everything seems to be built from scratch. Um, that in many ways is the challenge that cities face. Cities are um, typically individualistic, uh, rather like human beings. We all think we're unique, and we are, but we have a common DNA. Um, and so the EIP has really been set up to try and understand what is that common DNA and how can you help address that. So the challenge of building from scratch and uniqueness, particularly in a post-COVID setting, puts some real pressure on cities to actually respond, to accelerate, to use digitization, to transform. Within the EIP, the concept that we've put together, also linked to the SCCO and Lighthouse programs, is very simple. It's that of packaging. If we could put together a set of material that meant that cities did not have to start from scratch and actually had some simple, clear guidance, which is familiar, which is trusted, which they can have confidence in, then we'll move forward. Alas, across the world, we get a whole plethora of material thrown at us in terms of guides, tools, standards, all those sorts of things. 
So the approach we've taken is to try and uh, write to the audience. Clearly, you don't give a 150-page technical specification to a politician. You give something which is very simple, very clear, and very crisp in political language. So we've got a four-step process that looks at engaging the audience, and that would be real people, citizens out there. That would be politicians, um, civil servants, and such like. So engage the audience, make the case, support implementation, and sustain value. So addressing the entire life cycle. Um, and we're trying to actually produce material which is consistent in its look and feel. Rather like you go down to the bookstore, the Mr. Men book in the back, all males that go out shopping, um, wander down to the back of the store and they know those are things they can buy with confidence for the kids. If we can produce something which manages the balance between individualism and consistency, and that is a really cautious balance that we need to, to, to uh, put in place, then we can actually have a portfolio of material which is guides and standards. Within Urban Platform, we've produced to date about 10 documents. Again, they straddle those four different stages of engaging the audience and such like. And importantly, it's, in, uh, it's useful to recognize that some of those have already moved to standards organizations. And that's important from the standpoint of building trust. So there's a British and there's a German standard that's actually been produced on urban data platforms. Um, and, and that starts to create a, a portfolio of material that cities can have confidence in, in terms of what they do and how they use it. So that in essence is key. And I think the final point I'd raise is that we don't all live in big cities. We live in small and medium cities in Europe, the majority of people. And those tend to be the cities that don't attract the interest of investors, don't attract the interest of industry. And those are the ones that we can really help. Those are also the ones that are quite often very, very keen to get a hold of this sort of material. So from the standpoint of demand aggregation, that I think is the sweet spot of where we can take useful, trusted material to mid and small sized cities to aggregate demand and really create a market to advance for the majority of Europe. Thanks. Thank you, Graham. Now I'm moving to my uh, commission colleagues. And in order to round up the picture of available tools, both Georg and Victor, could you tell me what are the specific initiatives of the different DGs that promote digitalization in the cities and their digital transition? Um, I would give uh, Victoire the floor, ladies first. <laughs> and then Thank I you very much. Follow. Thank you very much, Georg. Thank you, Svet, for the questions and to other speakers also for the uh, interesting input already that has been uh, that has been commented on. Um, I would say from from DG Move perspective, we very much. Uh, welcome uh, this uh, cross-sectorial approach to enhance uh, digitalization in cities um, and uh, I think Graham has already underlined the discrepancy in the different cities and the need for financial support to ensure uh, investment in cities on um, on digitalization I think specifically for example on creating more data so this cross-sectorial approach is very much needed but at the same time um, we also need to integrate what has been done uh, in the different sectors so specifically on transport and mobility uh, we have already um, a strong architecture um, that has been developed on accessing data to support the development of services also services for city uh, for example, uh, multimodal travel information services that will be very useful in the context of a recovery for users, for example, to know whether the vehicle is empty or whether it's peak time. So to support um, access to data and the development of services, we have uh, established through existing legislation national access point for mobility uh, for real-time traffic information, for example, for multimodal uh, information services as well. And those uh, national access points form uh, the backbone for us of what will be 
the mobility data space that has been announced uh, in the data strategy that uh, DigiConnect uh, is also uh, leading on. And we, so therefore we really much see uh, the need to integrate um, what is being done uh, at a sectorial level and to build on the architecture uh, to develop uh, those uh, cross-sectorial benefits and digitization in cities. Georg, maybe on, I will give you another floor for energy. Um, yes, sure. Um, uh, I would, however, cut uh, the, my statement on policy uh, shorter. Um, there's a whole, lot, a whole range of, of things we do uh, from the side of energy to support cities. There is also, for instance, uh, the Covenant of Mayors initiative, um, which also pretty much like the Living in EU initiative looks into commitments of cities and support cities in planning and performing, implementing um, their climate uh, and energy action plans. Um, there is an action under the so-called strategic energy technology plan on so-called positive energy districts, which is um, a very common theme. It's a bit like a red thread through many things we do also inside the uh, innovation partnership. So, uh, and that also brings in aspects of mobility uh, and ICT. So uh, what I would like to emphasize um, um, is actually that it's, it's all about integration. So um, we are not looking only at ICT or only at energy or only at mobility. Um, the, the reality in cities is a complex one, is a holistic one. So you cannot tackle one thing without looking at the other. So that's one very important aspect, I think. And um, so we are also trying to involve digitalization, just to say that also in energy policies, quite evidently, there is smart grids, there's uh, the bridge project, for instance, which looks specifically into that uh, area. Now back to uh, the innovation partnership, I think um, Graham said it already, what we need to try, uh, what we need to do is actually to find a common ground for cities. So a bit like a, a, a one-stop shop or a, a place to go uh, in order to find all the wealth of information which is really needed and helpful. Um, so that going back to, for an instance, uh, living in EU, um, that's quite a substantial commitment. Uh, looking into digitalization, specifically data and, and these kinds of things, uh, that needs to be linked back into a wider context, I feel. So I guess what we can do and what, what uh, the, the marketplace or the, the uh, smart cities marketplace can do there is actually to bring these different aspects together and uh, try to present them pretty much following the packaging uh, uh, concept uh, which was introduced by Graham uh, in an easy, accessible way across sectors so that cities are not bound to any sort of specific environment but that they can just pick what they need and, and get help to implement that, in fact. So that's a bit my take on it since we are also in the context of a matchmaking uh, event here. Thank you. Thank you, Georg, and thank you, Vico Bern. I think we have a very clear common line going through all these presented initiatives that we saw about this integrating of the sectors of the data, combining, etc. Now, my next question will be the same for all of you, and it is now that we have an overview of the initiatives, how can they collaborate among themselves and also with private investors? to upscale the investments and support for the cities and their digital transition when it's close to the market. Maybe we start in the same order, Wim? Yes, thank you. Um, well, living in the EU is, um, is in the process of collecting solutions, of good solutions. And uh, basically, all the material that has been collected further developed by the EIP could be part of the inventory that we are making and the inventory that we are also going to organize in a way that cities can easily find the solution or the basis of a solution for the challenge that they have. Um, this is in, from our perspective very much in the making. I think we can also learn from what the EIP has been doing on the same uh, type of work, basically. Um, so uh, some of the solutions are already in our uh, 
prelim preliminary uh, inventory. So that's just a matter of um, finding more material that we can uh, integrate in our work. So that's part one on the question on investments. I think what uh, Martin was saying is very important. Um, in our solutions, we will be able to find private companies that have already been delivering full solutions are part of the solutions to the cities. So that they are, they can be considered as trusted parties. Of course, cities have to respect their own rules, not to mention the word procurement, of course, collaborative procurement is very important as a potential here. It's one of the questions put forward in Slido. Um, so this is one of those preconditions uh, too, that I mentioned in my first uh, interventions that need to be in place in order to really have the upscaling that we want. Um, so this is uh, a way of collaborating or stimulating private involvement, private investments. And even if it's then maybe not as close to market as we would like, but of course the financial commitment that is in our declaration for the cities, regions and member states is very much about voluntary contributions to a common investment fund, public investment fund, and doing all we can to contribute to synergies between public funds, including the European ones. So this is fully public, but it could give the funding for the more risky investments and innovations that we also want to stimulate. And that could build, be the basis or be the built the trust needed for private companies to then do the follow-up investment. So I think in that respect, living in the EU can play its, uh, its role. Thank you, Vim. Martin? I think that there are a couple of uh, ways to uh, avoid the fragmentation that we all agree is detrimental because it's so frustrating if we have good stuff, but it doesn't work together, then how do we do? Um, at least three things. So first of all, um, try not to harmonize everything. <clears throat> so find a minimal but sufficient common ground. That's one thing. <clears throat> because if we need a lot of people, including the standardization organizations who are, will not even start, uh, who say, oh yeah, we will use our standards. No, no, we will use our standards, says the other organizers. I, it, it's not just you know, getting agreement. It is to have something which is so concise that we can actually achieve agreement. That's one thing. The power of the networks. So your cities and the other networks um, is really, uh, one way to get over these project bubbles where you build communities around funding. But if you really want to cater for the demand side as well as the suppliers, you need to address the, the reality, the reality on the ground, the reality in the market. And there the networks, and we have seen the ones who are behind the living in the EU and are engaged in the EIPSCC as well. Um, really one way to overcome this fragmentation. So. Another thing is also that the networks do different things. So the broad policy, I mean, your city should put the big cities in the front. But as you say, um, uh, Graham, there's more <laughs> smaller places. So, and there are the technical issues. So, so really getting this uh, network collaboration in place and it is in place, it's really nice to see. And then I think <clears throat> finally, you know, um, ensuring that it's driven by stuff that works that, that you know, it's being bought, it's being put into the procurement uh, documents and so on. Um, and I can see some, some of the questions are, so um, there are other initiatives like this. Yes, there are other initiatives like the Big Buyers Initiative, like what, what uh, Graham talked about in the IPSCC, yes. So whatever we make in these three streams, whether it's minimal specifications, uh, whether it's the networks working together, it's the market, let's ensure that no matter which funding source or which initiative, wants to work together it can be integrated and used like lego bricks so let's try and be a little bit more minimal not uh, conquer the entire world or eat the elephant thanks matt the message was very clear uh graham you had already prepared something about this question in written so for you it's going to be easy probably now to give your opinion on it so um, <laughs> collaboration two fronts firstly collaboration amongst the initiatives that are putting the substance together that's absolutely vital so so that goes without saying um you know picking up on Wim's point 
I think that we need to bring together and produce some really trusted substance. Without substance, um, nobody's going to come to the party to play. So we really do need to put together some really good quality, very simple material that actually helps all of the different audiences, the politicians right the way through to the operator that's actually proving value. That for me is vital. Unless we have substance, we have nothing to show. We have got quite a lot of that substance. Point number two is, it's really important picking up on Georg's point, that um, the material we put together on data management links to the material that we put together on transport or on healthcare or on any other aspect of cities. Then you create something which is coherent. It doesn't need to be complicated. It does, however, need to be coherent. So Martin's point about Lego, I use Lego as the analogy, is a wonderful means by which you can innovate or you can build it cheaply. So for that standpoint, collaboration amongst, shall we say, the providers of material to produce easy, interoperable substance, guides, tools, those sorts of things is vital. Collaboration is also required in the field. So what's happening in the field in terms of cities? Well, here's the truth. Having surveyed 100 cities around Europe, most of which are involved in the lighthouse communities, about how do they approach the justification for digitization, 50% of them say we do it because we believe it's the right thing to do. I, it's a sort of policy statement. And it takes a long time because that involves politicians. The other half require a detailed business case. It's almost like a schizophrenic relationship. I just do it because it's a good idea to digitize or show me that there's some real value from that. Now that's intriguing from the standpoint of, so how do you engage the investment community? Now an individual platform and the business models for data management in cities doesn't cost as much money as building a new building. So the actual money that we're talking about isn't a huge amount at an individual city level, yet it is vital that cities move forward with that. So what can the investment community do? Well, if the investment community can look towards a portfolio of materials which is trusted, then they can turn around to the uh, cities using institutions like the Commission that can convene the audience and say, if you guys come together and work together, I'll give you better quality money because it's trusted investment. Then we'll get scale and then we can go to the market and you'll get cheaper product. So in other words, the uh, cities collaborating, the investors stimulating that collaboration, supported by the Commission to convene it, provides the opportunity to create accelerated market adoption of data solutions. What does that do? 2% of a city's budget is on technology. 98% of a city's budget is on delivering better quality infrastructure and services. That 2% can influence the 98%. And that's the real transformation opportunity that we face as a result of better digitization. It's a huge opportunity. And all players need to come back together to actually cause that to happen, which is why this whole marketplace and matchmaking is really, really important as an opportunity. My views. Thanks, Graham. I think the views are converging to a great extent. The, the use of the example with the Lego, I think Martin has a bit more legitimacy to use it because he actually worked with Lego in Denmark. But yes, I think you used it first. Um, and then let's see what uh, Victoire can say about it then. Yes, I think uh, Martin also made a very, very good point about network. So I think one of the key elements I would like to emphasize here is the idea of building on network, uh, specifically again for transport, but that could be leveraged for all sectors. We have a very good initiative, uh, Civitas, so an initiative of network for cities 
to, for cities and to find solutions for cities as well on sustainable urban mobility uh, with living labs in 18 cities. So you have more than 300 cities being part and it's also uh, financed uh, by the European Commission. You also have um, so pilot projects in place, but also policy reflection projects, specifically, for example, on urban vehicle access regulation, real-time traffic information, where cities can exchange, find the best uh, solution, and also potentially exchange to find uh, financing and to see uh, where the appropriate financing could come from to support their idea on digitalization, for example. And to, to, to uh, maybe another point, so first of all, network and exchange. And the second point I would like to highlight as well is support. Uh, from our side in DigiMove, we have also established uh, SOMP guidelines, uh, so sustainable urban mobility plans, specifically, for example, on ITS and mobility as a service, where cities can find uh, practitioner briefings uh, to help them also uh, develop um, develop their mobility management plans and build on uh, best practices, share best practices with uh, other cities. Yeah, Georg, could you finish this round? I, I will. Thank you very much, uh, Svet. Um, two things. Um, first thing is that um, since uh, Victoire has also mentioned the sustainable urban mobility plans, um, there is indeed an organized, um, let's say, commitment by cities. I mentioned the Covenant of Mayors. We have the Living in EU initiative, the Joint Boost Sustain Declaration. Um, and so on. So we have quite a lot of commitment around. Um, so we could actually, we should, in fact, use that and take cities by the word and pull them into the market, really. I mean, that is one thought I have. But also on political level, like on EU level, we could do that. Um, we could integrate that commitment into common action, like really take that as an entry stage kind of thing for cities to you know to receive funding to give you an example we do that since years with the uh, lighthouse projects where we ask for uh, an existing sustainable energy and climate action plan as a prerequisite to be actually evaluated uh, so that could be an idea to really you know leverage this commitment into something which brings a benefit to cities and to make other cities convince other cities to join that club so that's a bit on this commitment side of things um, then on the actual network side of things, um, I'm glad that Victoire has mentioned Civitas. That's really a good point. I think there is a number of really great long-standing uh, initiatives out there. Civitas is one of the oldest initiatives, in, in fact, in this urban landscape. Um, and so the idea is actually um, that with the Smart Cities Marketplace, we bring these initiatives together, really, so that we have indeed i mean people tend to you know we were always bragging about silos and, and stuff but in fact i think it is good to have initiatives to dive a bit deeper into one sector provide the excellence the guidance the standards um the toolkits and so on but there should be also one place where all of that get comes together so that picky uh, cities can easily pick what they need, really what's addressing their needs, rather than being overwhelmed by solutions they might not need or might be not able to implement or deploy. And that is actually where the Smart Cities Marketplace kicks in and where matchmaking kicks in. That's what, what Graham also said. Um, I, I think that our job and our idea is to, to make it work better so that cities can really pick from a catalogue get inspired by other cities, by other projects, and take that forward into the matchmaking in front of the investor networks or with other funding instruments. But that's exactly where the marketplace kicks in um, uh, and wants to help with that, in fact. And, and here I stop. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Georg. I think this is also the idea of the Living in EU initiative, as Martin also spoke about a marketplace, which is slightly different than the EIPSCC or Smart Cities Marketplace and they're complementary, which is great and they work together and there is also a marketplace that will be developed in the Intelligent Cities Challenge 
again with another angle. So if we put all these marketplaces together, addressing the problem from slightly different sides, then I think we are ending up with a really comprehensive solution. But thanks, this was really a very nice overview. Um, now we have only five minutes left, and I would like to ask you just to finish with one minute each to tell me, not to me, but to the participants, in view of today's event, what is your message to them, to the audience? And why is it important to take part in the matchmaking from your point of view, which is starting now? Yes, uh, maybe the same order in order to simplify it. Vim, could you start one minute? With pleasure. Of course, we are here talking to the audience, which is already convinced to participate because in a few minutes you will start your matchmaking. So that makes the message um, not less important. Um, participate, that's all I can say and continue participating. I'm representing the city of Antov. We participate in many smart city projects like many other cities do as well. We are considered often as a very mature city and I think to a certain extent we are, but at the same time we struggle. It's a bloody difficult job to put it like that, to, um, to upscale your project results, even within our own city, we're working hard on it. But it's difficult and we can we can still learn from many people um, and we can get inspiration from from others on different topics that we we may want to uh, implement in our city as well so that's the message i'm conveying here which you already responded positively to and uh, all the good luck for the rest of the day thanks Vim. martin you have the minute thank you i think it's really inspiring to see um, how the different levels uh, are coming together in the COVID-19 uh, situation. We have realized something that I think many have thought about for a long time. Oh, if we could leverage all the resource, all the data, um, all the existing initiatives, all the work we've done in a simple way to put things together so we don't need like a 12-month procurement uh, cycle to do some things. That realization, I think, COVID-19 has really given us. So that's inspiring. So I'm, I'm quite actually positive uh, that the many initiatives we have that have this T-shape, very, very good on the focused vertical side, um, is, is shaping a more uh, common uh, ground. Um, so I'm quite positive, uh, very happy to see so many faces here today. Great, thank you, Martin. Graham, could you summarize your view in one minute? No, I could do it in 30 seconds. So firstly, I agree with Martin, post-COVID uh, provides an enormous opportunity. My one message would be around mindset. Um, as cities, we focus on differences. Let's focus on commonalities, not on differences. Thanks, that was great. And you did it in maybe less than 30 seconds. Then, uh, Victoire? Very quickly, I think for cities, there's already, as I said, uh, many initiatives, sectorial initiatives, Civitas, but also support for implementing uh, legislation that they can build on and that they can use, and we offer support for that purpose. But they can also uh, benefit in the context of this matchmaking event on a cross-sectorial initiative to bridge maybe the missing gaps creation of data, more support maybe uh, for digitization of, uh, of platforms. So have a good day and um, I hope uh, you have a lot of interesting chats. Thanks, Victoire. And I think, Georg, you're the right person as the heart behind <laughs> you. Yes, you the right the right famous person. last words. <laughs> um, thank you, Sven. <laughs> um, yeah, just a very quick uh, recap from the first day, in fact, uh, just a reassurance from uh, Investor End. They also said that COVID-19 actually doesn't infect uh, affect them uh, in, such, uh, in such a strong way. Um, in fact, most of the investors are interested in, in doing long-term investments. So COVID-19 is, as I, as I indicated at the beginning, is actually re-strengthening what we do. So COVID-19 is actually pushing for doing more, doing, uh, doing it now and really, you know, get to action. Um, as concerns this day and this, this matchmaking event, um, I can only echo what has been said. Get involved, do your networking, look across your specific need 
So if you are only interested in energy, you might find that mobility and ICT can solve parts of your problem as well. There's a wealth of information available. Um, do the explore, meet people. You can also meet us. Um, uh, should we still be around? Uh, I will be certainly around for, for the day. So um, enjoy the event, get your heads around, uh, get involved and much success with that. Thank you. Thank you, Georg. I thank the whole panel for their participation. It was really a great session, not only because of the views that were given, but also we managed to do it in a very organized way. So we fin started and finished on time. That was great. I will also encourage the participants to, to go into the matchmaking sessions and also maybe check out the two explore sessions that will show them some examples from two cities that have implemented and participated in these initiatives that we have had that were described today at the panel. So thanks everybody and enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers all. Cheers. It's Ilko Kreisinger again, one of the matchmakers of the matchmaking team of the uh, Smart City Marketplace. So that was a great panel, well organized, as Svet was saying, who was hosting it. Uh, we will continue uh, with our next session at 11.15, where we have, uh, let's say, a deep dive into one case study from the city of Rotterdam, from Roland van der Heide, who is the project manager of digital of that, of that great city. Um, in the meantime, uh, do watch this live stream. We will have uh, some entering, inter interesting intermezzos there uh, before we start at 11.15 again. So I hope to see you soon and uh, stay in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye.